My last example, and then I'll conclude, uh, since uh, this is the woman's theory, is that um, people are very prejudiced against women politicians, but they can change their mind easily. The surprising fa par fact in this, uh, in this fact was not the first one, but the second one, just. Uh, this is um, uh, a fact that I discovered in India, where I've been studying for many years, a policy that uh, grants quota for women in politics at the lowest, uh, at the village level. One third of every village in India, at any point of time, must be run by a woman. So every five years there is an election, and the woman, and every one third of the villages are selected to be headed by a woman. A few years ago, I engaged into a research program to look at the effect of these policies. And my first paper found two things. First, found that women are good leaders. They are less likely to take bribes than men. Uh, and they are doing things that, that help women more. In particular, they invest more in drinking water. The second thing I found is that uh, men, in particular, are very prejudiced against women. So even when everything seems to say that the performance of women is at least as good, uh, they give their leader a lowest rating if it turns out to be a woman. So that was a little bit depressing. So the next question I ask is, is this policy of quota helping overcome uh, this bias against women? So after two, two cycles of election with reservation, that's how they call the quota in India, I conducted a survey of um, about 600 of this uh, village council in, uh, in one district in West Bengal. And I went to people uh, with tape, with a tape recorder and played a tape, tape for them with a speech that was pronounced by one of these political leaders. The speech was the same, but it was recorded either by a female or by a male. And then I asked people to listen to the speech, to one of the speech, either the male speech or the female speech, and to tell me, what do you think? Do you like this leader? How would you rate them? Would you vote for them, etc.? Sure enough, what we find is that when people have never been exposed to a woman leader, they rate the woman's speech much below, even though it's the same, which is a sign of their uh, bias against women. What I also found, however, in this work is that after being exposed to a woman leader, this bias entirely disappears. If anything, uh, people who have been exposed to a woman leader rank the female speech slightly higher than the male speech. That means that people are willing to learn from experience. They've actually seen a woman at work and seen that, in fact, she was quite good and get convinced by that. The reason I mention this uh, particular example, other than the fact that it's, um, it's, it shows it's re relevant to, uh, to women and to, the needs of, to how to better represent the needs of women, is because it uh, touches upon a question that many people ask me, which is, it's fine, you, you're working about uh, how to improve the schools and how to improve the health system and things like that. But at the end of the day, you're not asking the real question because what really matters is politics. Tinkering with the details and improving the policies on the margin, that's just lowering your ambition. The only thing you need is to fix the political process. Out of good political process, good policies will naturally emerge and out of a bad political politics, you'll never have good policies. So it should be clear from uh, the rest of uh, what I said that I somewhat disagree with this point of view. And I disagree with this point of view for two reasons. One is the example I just gave you, which is it is true that politics matter, but politics is as well the process of a set of rules and a set of ways in which things are organized. For example, whether or not you have mandated representation of women influences both the policies in the short run and the political process by changing the opinion of people and changing the way people decide about who should be their leaders. The second thing is, I think although politics determine to an extent what is doable and what is not, so it's going to be easier to change the policy for the poor in Brazil than in the Congo, even within that, uh, there is considerable, considerable amount of slack to do better. 
And that's true in bad countries. That's true in countries that have bad institutions, where it's sometimes possible to do something somewhere, and maybe even to start a virtuous process. And it is true, and perhaps that's even more important, in countries that have pretty good institutions. In a country like India, which has pretty good institutions, there are plenty of very bad policies. And those policies are not always bad because it is in someone in someone's interest that they are bad. These policies are often bad because of the three I problem that I mentioned in the introduction. They are bad because not enough thinking went into designing the policy, not enough rigor went into evaluating the policy, not enough imagination went into thinking about what to do next. So the objective of this book, the objective of my work, is really to try and say, let's try and fix that. In a sense, that's a very hopeful message that I want to give, which is there is scope to do things here and now in improving the lives of the poor. It may or may not lead to growth, but at least we can improve the lives of the poor. But it's also a message of responsibility, which is we cannot hide either behind the complexity of the problem, where are we even going to start? You can start by anything, really, from a small entry, a small problem well-defined to solve. And we cannot uh, hide either behind uh, this is not really our problem, this is a big institutional problem, this comes from the country, or let's leave it to the World Bank, or let's leave it to the international institution. It's really kind of everybody's problem at their own level, uh, here and there in the developing countries. Thank you very much. Thank you.